definitely not experts, so we want a disclaimer everyone first that we are definitely just parents figuring it out as we go along. That's like my motto for parenting in general. Um, and what else was I going to say before we got started? Basically, because we are also not public speakers, we will probably be reading a lot. So I'm going to apologize up front. Hopefully we can still jazz you a little bit, but I'm a little nervous about it, I'm not going to lie. I can make a couple points. So um, first, if I can introduce myself, my name is Tiffany, for those of you who don't know me. I am a child of God. I am, I'm a wife of 15 years. I'm a mom of four. And um, I'm also a firstborn daughter. I am the firstborn grandchild. I am a child of teen parents. I am a sister. I am a product of divorce due to parents. I am a stepdaughter raised by a man who never called me that. He definitely called me his own. And then I'm a product of that divorce again. And then I'm a biological daughter to a dad who may or may not have credit for my childhood, but does now for my adulthood. I am a daughter to a stepmom who does everything to blend our families together, which makes me a sister to three sisters, one biological and two by marriage. And I think that's probably good about me. <laughs> my name is Michael. I am also a child of God, a husband of 15 years, dad of four, firstborn only child of still married parents part of my story is much smaller than her. Yeah, but I have better Christmas gifts, so. <laughs> so we are family. So this is our family. Kylie is our oldest. She is currently 14 years old. She came home in 2009. She was two and a half years old. She is a beautiful black young woman. The boys are Jordan and James. They are now nine and three quarters and eight years old. They came home in 2015. Jordan was three, almost four, and James has just turned two. Our boys are half Hispanic and half Caucasian. They are biological to each other. Mackenzie is the baby. She was our first baby. It was really weird to be telling people that this was my fourth child, but yet my first baby. Um, she came home at five months in 2018. On paper, she is half Caucasian and half black. But there is also paperwork stating that the bio father is Hispanic and not black. So we're really unsure at the moment. Uh, when we pursued our adoption of Mackenzie, we really wanted a racial mirror of our family for Kylie. She really wanted that too. And as we, as we were so excited when we were matched on paper with this black baby girl, only she is more of a racial mirror to her brothers. But that's not that's kind of what we love about everything going on in our family. We love being this kind of misfit match of everything. Yeah, kind of a body ball back and forth. So back um, in 2009 is when we first, oops, my thing came out on me. Sorry, one second. In 2009 is when we first became parents of Kylie. And the process is at the time was a lot different than it is now. So if there's any newbies here, which I think there's only a couple, um, it definitely was a lot different. They used to keep different lists, I got it right here, different lists for parents who are fostering only or adoptive. And we were through a private FFA called Family Connections, and our um, intentions were adoption cases only. So uh, we had just finished our home study, and we had submitted for these two boys in LA County when um, Kylie's case came across our social worker's desk and she really thought it was a match. There was really no information other than her race and her age. Um, so she submitted for us, and by that afternoon, we were actually matched and scheduled for our disclosure within two days. Um, so at the disclosure meeting, they told us, again, very limited information, um, but that he needed to be rehomed by the end of the week. So um, we being totally naive, first time parents, we were told that we would visit with the child, have overnights, like it would be this long, at least a month long process, and now she was coming home in two days. So we had to jump on everything, get things ready. Um, and we knew uh, instantly the moment we met her that she was the child that we had been praying and waiting for. So this uh, bottom picture here was in the car seat. That was from our very first visit with her where the foster mom let her take her out on her own. 
which felt like we were not qualified to do, even though I, we technically had a license, it still felt really odd. And um, we took her to get ice cream, and we let her get way too much. It was so bad. I, like, I get this memory, like, it's in there. I was so nervous. And then we gave her back, all sugared up. <laughs> and then we took her home. She came home the next day. And then this bottom picture here is one of my favorites. It's of Mike and Kylie. It's kind of hard to see, but um, they're doing tea party. And um, I'm going to get emotional again. That was one of the ways that they bonded a lot in the beginning when she first came home. <laughs> at the time Kylie was at her foster home, she had a foster brother that was reunifying with his bio mom and was starting overnight visits. When he would leave, Kylie would ask, where he was going. Her foster mother would tell her that she was staying with his mom. She would then ask where her mom was and when she was coming. So when we got matched, before we visited her for the first time, her foster mother had told her that her mom and dad were coming home to visit her. Just like the foster brother's mother had. Uh, that was it. After that, it clicked. From that moment on, we were mom and dad. Of course, there were some times for us to all bond. Of course, there were times for us to all bond. But from the start, she was looking for her parents, and we were looking for our baby as well. We found each other. It was great. It was really weird for her to call us mom and dad from day one. Yeah, it for was us, not for her. She liked that yeah. easy for her. <laughs> one of those things that, you know, the, the agencies and your process prepares you for not getting that right away. Right. And there it was. So these two pictures are from our first summer as a family and our first Christmas. Um, bonding was really easy at this time. It, it, was, it was perfect. So after about three months of bonding, our case was moving up the normal process towards adoption, and we were assigned a new social worker, our county adoption worker for adoption placement portion of this process. Uh, we were really excited to move. Jeff, can you go ahead and go to the next slide? It's not working for me. Um, so there was a knock at the door, and this isn't her, but she looks very similar to her. <laughs> um, but there was a knock at the door, and almost as soon as I opened it, I could immediately feel her annoyance of us and the whole situation. So we walked her into Kylie's room, and the whole time, I mean, you have to realize we were nervous, but we were such giddy, excited parents. We've had her three months at this point. We're walking her down the hallway to show her off her room that's all done up in Tinkerbell, and we're telling her how things are going, and she in, like, immediately interrupts us and says, well, I hope you're not getting too comfortable because I'm already looking at an aunt in LA to train her up to take custody of her because she needs to be with family. I was shocked. I thought, and I said back to her, but I thought that part, part of the process, she's the adoption social worker. Like I thought that part was already done, you know, like that part, they were already vetted. Um, I said, we're, ado we're an adoptive placement family to which she corrected me and she was right in terms of ter terminology. We were not an adoptive family. We were what's called a risk adopt family and that I should understand there is a risk. And so immediately we knew that she was not for us. <laughs> she was very much against us. Um, our hearts were broken. She was cold the rest of the visit, and right before she left, I tried to reconvince her that we are bonded as a family, and she told me how that was impossible and that she would forget us if she removed her tomorrow. And lastly, go ahead, she said to us that, next slide, sorry, <laughs> you will never, be able to teach her what it means to be a black woman, and you will never be able to do her hair. I was speechless, I was offended, I was hurt, and most importantly, I was scared that we were gonna lose our baby. What I didn't say, and honestly, I may have actually said it, I don't even remember. You know like when someone says something, you think about what you're gonna say afterwards? I don't know if it came out of my mouth or if it's just what I thought. But where my heart was at the moment is, isn't it more important that I teach her what it means to be a good person? Isn't it more important that I teach her what it means to be a strong woman? And of course, I can learn how to do her hair. My mom was like a hair Nazi. Um, but uh, even though it was the wrong way that the social worker handled the situation, I now understand where it was coming from. I can say that I didn't get it then, but I definitely get it now. And we're going to get into that as we go along. But those words have made such a huge impact on me as a parent, as a person, um, that they literally play on repeat in my mind to this day. You can go ahead and go next. I'm out of order. Sorry. Oh, I'm next. <laughs> so her hair. 
So these are pictures of her, her hair journey. So in the beginning, I knew that this was going to be the easiest thing to judge me as a mom and her as a daughter of a mom who's white. I knew that this is the easy point for us to be uh, judged on. And also, I really wanted to prove the social worker wrong. So I was so sensitive that this poor baby could not leave the house like a normal child with messy hair. I had to redo her hair, and it always looked perfect when she was very little. Um, and I, I learned, I grew, I, I wasn't great right away, I definitely didn't know it was a different texture, a different kind of hairstyle than, you know, what I was raised with, but I YouTubed it, I Pinterested it, I asked the cashier at Walmart what products she used, I was not afraid to ask questions, and as I learned, I actually ended up learning why her hair was important. Doing her hair actually started to become less about what other people thought, to this day, now I really could care less <laughs> what people think about it, but more about why it was important that it was her crown because it's rooted in her heritage and it was an important part of who she is. So one of my favorite memories now that I've kind of grown in here and you know it's been 12 years is um, one time I was in a black wig shop looking at extension hair to do box braids and point blank across the store this woman yells at me like why are you looking at hair and I said back to her like my daughter's black and I'm getting ready to do box braids and she looked at me and said you braid and I said yes and then she proceeded to just hype me up for the rest of the store. <laughs> like, totally just, we see you, Mom, you know, patting me on the back. It was amazing. Um, and then fast forward to last summer, I did box braids, and we went to Wild Water Adventures, and Kylie came up and said, Mom, how much would you charge to put braids in someone's hair? And I was like, what? And she said, <laughs> this black teenager, she didn't say that, but I'm telling you the context. Um, this girl in the wave pool asked me where I got my hair braided, and I said, well, my mom did it. And so she said, well, how much would she charge? And I, was, I lived on that, like, I was high on that compliment for like a month. <laughs> so I'm not perfect, but I definitely have grown. Uh, anyway, go ahead. Or do I keep going? Am I just letting you? So in fact, go ahead and go to the next slide. I now struggle with knowing how to do white girl hair. I seem to only know how to do black girl hair. Um, I really do struggle more with her hair than I do Kylie. <laughs> I wanted to say, and I meant to say this in the beginning, that, you know, we all know this, that we are very um, protective of our child's stories and sharing details like this. And I want you all to know that we have Kylie's blessing in what we're sharing. And the reason why it's more directed at Kylie is, for one, she's our first, and so all of our experience is wrapped in her. Um, this topic, though, even though it's easy to pinpoint all of this culture and heritage on transracial adoption, it really does apply to all adoptions. I really feel like even kinship, and even as foster care, like we all are pouring into these children, and so we're part of their core identity. So I just don't want that message to get lost. I meant to say that up front, and also to know that um, Kylie overheard a lot of this, and we sat and talked to her, and hopefully one day, you know, she'll be able to be comfortable to do it with us, but um, we do have her blessing in what we're sharing, so. Okay, sorry. All right. You can go to the next slide, Jeff, thanks. So what is culture? <clears throat> culture is what tells you how to live your life. Culture defines what you expect to eat for breakfast, how you dress, how you address your boss or your teacher, how close to stand to your friends, how to sit in a chair. Culture involves values. Culture tells you whether your, whether your family or your job is more important, who would be a good choice for a marriage partner, and how much skin is decently exposed at the swimming pool. That's your favorite line in that. <laughs> you learn culture by living it. You can change your culture with effort by living in another culture. The older you are, the harder it is to live successfully in a new culture just because you have so many years of cultural education and learned. Uh, our culture comes from people who, knew, who we knew and loved and raised us. Things such as health habits, mannerisms, figures of speech, ways to deal with things that are, um, are picked up from our parents, whether they're biological or adopted, and those were picked up from their parents, who picked them up from theirs, who picked them up from theirs, and so on. So what is heritage? Heritage, on the other hand, is what belongs to you by virtue of your birth. Heritage includes your genetic background, physical features, uh, and ethnic origin. It includes the history of people who share those features with you. Heritage consists only of facts, but one's culture may place more or less values more or less value on those facts. Whether or not you know or care anything about your heritage, it belongs to you. We receive our genetic heritage from our biological parents. 
who received them from their biological parents, who received it from theirs, and back and back. This is our biological heritage. It affects such things as our coloring, our bone structure, and our predisposition to inherited diseases. This was the only thing she did not give me permission to use, and I did it anyway. This is still my <laughs> contact for her in my phone, it's is that true. picture. It's my favorite. It's her Gary Busey picture. And her hair is not perfect, obviously, in this picture. So. <laughs> but we are both. So although our biological heritage may be responsible for our curly brown hair and well-formed vocal cords, our culture and heritage gave us strong work ethic our culture heritage gave a strong work ethic and an affinity and love of music that turns us into the, the talented musicians. In this way, both heritages contribute to who we are. So what is our parental role then? Uh, as adoptive parents, which I, as parents in general, you cannot expect to maintain your child's birth culture because it is impossible to teach a culture unless you are living it. That was like a really hard truth for me to hear. I was like, finally, I get it. Because everyone would ask, like, are you teaching her culture? I didn't understand what that meant. <laughs> That's because culture and heritage are two different things. So you can't teach a culture unless you're living it. So the culture we're teaching is what we have in our homes, right? What came from, what, what we gathered from our parents, who got it from their parents, and so on. So the best we can do, though, is to hope to learn as much as possible about our child's birth culture and heritage. And to know that it's not our child's job, primarily because they obviously don't know it. You know what I mean? That's a learned thing. So we have to do it, but we also have to recognize that we might not embrace the values of our child's birth culture. It might not fit with our family structure or who we are as a family. So we have to discover what those values still are and show our child why, the, why those existed in the time and place that they existed. It's still important that they know their birth culture. Learning about culture, though, is hard, especially if you don't have somebody that you can help you out with that culture, from that culture. This is why it's important to find those racial mirrors in your community. And I would also say, as adoptive or foster family, um, it's important to also find families that look like yours, like a biracial family. It's, impor it's important that your family as a whole has that um, mirror, right, in other families and other children. Many of us have no access to our child's culture, especially if you have like a foreign adoption. Um, we may be, or we may be too threatened by its value to explore it further. And I bolded that, too, because that's also kind of a hard uh, to swallow, right? <laughs> As parents, we are obligated to help our children discover their heritage. If we wait for the media, the kid down the street, a counselor at college, or a child's prospective employer to educate our children, it is in, it, if we educate our child, our child is in for a lot of unhappiness. Find out good stuff. Give your child a foundation of pride that he or she can refute or ignore the bad mis misinformed stuff that is sure to come later. <laughs> no, you did good. <laughs> this is where those words, you will never be able to teach her what it means to be a black woman, play on repeat in my mind. How can I teach her to be a proud black woman since I am obviously not one? How? So that's where. This is what I've come up with. So I feel like I can teach her what it means to be a black woman based on the following. First, what is adoption to us? For us, being adopted is being grafted in, like grafting in plants, which from cross which from cross-pollinating two plants is producing a hybrid seed. Rather, grafting plants uses roots of the bottom portion of the plant and attach it into a tender shoot of the top of the portion of another plant. This is often done with trees and shrubs to combine the best characteristics of the two plants. So this is an image of a grafting tree, grafted tree. So grafting, so grafting doesn't mean that an orange becomes a lemon or a lime becomes an orange. Rather, they remain the fruit they are, but they start to change characteristics based on the development in the grafting process. A lemon may become sweeter, and an orange may become sour. To me, this was such a perfect image of our family, because also if you look at the tree, 
it is also now forever changed. It's no longer just an orange tree. It's now something entirely new. It is being a family that has been grafted together means there are different fruits on a new tree with deep roots. We have all been changed, but we can also still have the things that we cannot change. So she's back. So let's go back to, uh, I almost said her name. That would have been really bad. <laughs> this social. <laughs> 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 so back to the when she really shook things up for us. Uh, let's talk about her comments one more time. What I learned now is it's likely that her comments came to us from a place of recognizing her heritage, cultural heritage, in Kylie. When, we, when she first saw Kylie, she saw herself, and then she saw these two ignorant young white kids who have never parented, who have little to no color in their lives, uh, wanting to raise this baby. So even though I don't agree with her, I can understand where she was coming from looking back on it now, especially now that I'm older. So remember when we talked about that slide about parental roles? The last line of that slide said, many of us have no access to our child's culture or we may be too threatened by its values to explore it further. Well, that was totally us. We had zero desire to have any type of open adoption. In fact, we wanted to keep all anonymity through the process, and we did actually. Um, we didn't go to court, none of that. We had all anonymity. Because we were threatened, we thought that any kind of contact with bio family would affect our family's bond and how we grew. But this social worker, when she could not make uh, reunification with bio family happen, decided that we need to have an open relationship with her maternal grandmother and her six bio siblings, all who were in long-term placement with the maternal grandmother. We hated the idea at first, but the lady said jump, and we said how high. <laughs> like We were going to do whatever we had to do to keep my, our baby. So she asked us to meet her, gr the grandmother and the older sister, who was 13 at the time, um, at a therapy session. So there was a counselor, our social worker, uh, their social worker, and the county social worker. Um, during this session, we – I lost my place. Hold on. It was there that we learned that Grandma just wanted Kylie to know that she fought for her and that she wanted her. She didn't want her to grow up and learn that she had all six of her brothers and sister and not her. It wasn't her fault the county wouldn't let her have another child. They had to eventually stop after six. Um, she just didn't want Kylie to be hurt thinking that she wasn't wanted or want, wasn't loved. The sister was more of a mother to her during the t her first two years of life than their own bio mom, was very protective. In fact, that's why she was in the system. The sister was the one that told, hey, my mom had another baby. You need to go get her. She's not taking care of her. And she took care of her for the first two years at 13. So she was 11, right? Um, so she shared with us, though, that she was so excited that Kylie was going to get to have a mom and a dad. And that she told Mike how she, I got goosebumps again, <laughs> how she never had a dad and how she was so thankful that Kylie was going to get, her baby sister would get to have it. She just wanted, though, to be in Kylie's life. She loved her so much. She loves her so much. So both Mike and I immediately left that meeting, immediately wanting a relationship with them and fully understanding where their hearts were and knowing that it was not their fault that this situation, the brokenness existed. That was not on them. And um, we also really knew in our hearts that Kylie deserved to know a family who loved her this much. Woo, I got goosebumps all over. So... <coughs> So we opened the door that threatened us, and it has been one of the greatest blessings in our lives. Just like any relationship, trust had to be built, and we had to get to know one another. We would meet up monthly and then every other month at first, um, you know, at Chuck E. Cheese, things like that. And then eventually they moved out of state, so it became less and less. Uh, these pictures, that's not all of them, huh? Just the ones on the left. Okay, so they moved to Las Vegas, and recently I, I took them, uh, Jordan, our oldest son, and Kylie, to go see their family in Las Vegas, and just watching the whole experience really inspired me to make this happen every year, because it, it wasn't, you know, yeah, Kylie benefited a lot from it, but all those other kids, they benefited so much, too, from just, I think Kylie was the reason to bring them all together. Mm -hmm that day and that you could tell you know people live their lives and now they're older kids and they're off doing stuff so to have a reason to come together meant a lot too 
So this relationship has been a vital part of building up, a vital part of building, uh, this relationship has been vital part of building up the part of Kylie that we can't give her, her heritage and birth culture background. I know this isn't everyone's story. We have three other children who do not have a bio relationship, but if you can open yourself up to the idea of this relationship, not letting the feelings of risk or threat win, and if the bio family you're connecting with is supportive of your family and the plan for adoption. Which I would say only if they are, because yeah. that's so important. Then it can be really amazing. Uh, these faces have become a part of our family tree. Yes. Uh, they feel like family to us and to Kylie. Uh, you know, as negative as that experience was, we were really grateful that we were forced to go into that experience and kind of gain the second part of our family. Absolutely. If you are unable to have a relationship or contact with bio relatives, what we have done is gather a lot of information, as, as much information as possible through being cyber stalkers. <laughs> Tiffany is great at being an internet stalker. Um, Maybe we should mute the live stream for this part. <laughs> no, <just kidding. laughs> Be wise and be careful. Uh, she has built family trees, gathered photos uh, of our children to, to be able to answer questions about their heritage as much as we could possibly grab so that someday we can answer questions for them. Yeah, so if, if you're new and or if you, some of us just know this is a fact, you don't get a whole lot of information on your child, right? Their background, the files. Although it's with all of our adoptions, one was this big and one was like, Kylie was cut and paste and it has some other people's information <laughs> in it that have nothing to do with her. So he's right. Internet stalking safely and within boundaries is good because I am able to know, I've learned what diseases that cousins or uncles or grandparents have. I've learned obesity, I've learned you know diabetes, those kind of things. I've learned um, their heritage. I've learned how much for the boys I know grandparents and what, what their their heritage is, is just based on Facebook. <laughs> I would say get perspectives from the social workers. Yes. We had asked if this type of relationship was going to be good for the boys and they said absolutely not. Yeah. This family is just not a good fit for themselves really. Yeah. So. Yeah. So um, who am I? Okay good it's working. So the day came when Kylie was in third grade, which is multicultural day, it was multicultural week. And we had to dress up this paper doll based on her biological heritage. And this was the first time that Mike and I really had to sit down and discuss what we were gonna tell her of who she is. And we actually didn't know what her heritage was. Um, so thankfully we had grandma that we could ask. So we asked grandma and she honestly didn't know, um, which we can, we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but she did tell me that she's got five sisters, they're all different colors. Um, but she thinks they're mostly Creole or French because a lot of her family came from New Orleans. So we started looking into things to decorate the doll based on that fact. Um, but then I just kept thinking back to being grafted in and it didn't feel right that this was all that Kylie was. So um, I felt really strongly that she's not just her bioheritage, that she's a part of us too. So we decided to make her both. So this was her doll. Um, her doll ended up being French, African, Irish, and German uh, because she is both. She's both her bioheritage, which is at the time what we knew, African and French, and her adopted cultural heritage, which is more Irish and German. Um, we didn't get our culture from our, I'm sorry, if we did get our culture from our parents, then our parents' bioheritage has to also play a factor. So if we're influencing her culture, then our biological heritage then would also have a effect on her. So even though she is no, nowhere German, she must have German influence because we have influence on her. This was my thinking, okay? So this is why her doll looks like this. And I think that it is really important that we can't focus on one or the other. Like to ignore one or to highlight only one doesn't really die, give her a solid foundation um, as she grows and wants to dive in deeper into her identity. But we did actually, oops, I went wrong way. We did actually do one of these and just for anonymity's sake, she is Kylie Skywalker. That's not her last name. Um, but this was Although amazing. we were close to <laughs> naming her Kylie Chewbacca, it, we, parents I talked us out of it. That's actually a true story. <laughs> he wanted her middle name to be Chewbacca because everyone, like, what's a middle name? But yeah, 
his mom wouldn't let us. Okay, so knowing where you come from is so important. I'm reading your part. I'm reading the blue. I did it. (laughs) When Kylie was 13, we decided to do the 23andMe DNA test. It turns out that she's mostly Nigerian, which was news to her and her grandma, and that she is, in fact, Irish. She's 7% Irish. Who knew? Yeah. Um, It's funny to click because we did do the relatives, but I turned it on and off just to look to see what relatives she's had. And it's interesting because most of her relatives on there are actually white. So I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. And mostly from Europe. Um, I highly recommend doing this because it was really cool to watch Kylie get answers to these questions. And there's um, another component here, too. Because of the history of slavery, it's actually hard to trace uh, black ancestry. So doing tests like this gives her a broader picture of who she is and where she comes from. Be the bridge, transracial adoption guide, (laughs) a book, says a sense of belonging is critical to overall health of anyone, but especially in a child. We want to make our children feel loved and that they belong. But in the lives of transracial adoptees, there are layers of complexity that add to their sense of belonging. In addition to the primal wound of losing birth parents, They must also navigate being raised in a different racial group. Their vital need to belong requires additional parenting skills. We must find ways to more deeply understand the layers of this reality and develop the tools we need to give our children a secure sense of belonging. Right. I wasn't going to say this, but like, are you guys caught up on This Is Us? (laughs) This whole paragraph reminds me so much of the last episode. So if you haven't, This totally applies to the last episode, (laughs) and I see not, so yes, it does. So what are these tools? Uh, I would first say the first tool is humility, uh, starting with understanding the importance of both culture and heritage in raising your child. I don't believe that this only applies to transracial adoptions, like I said. As a stepdaughter, being raised by a stepdad, I can understand and relate to a lot of this. I understand that who I am has a lot to do, well, more to do with him than my biological father, because I didn't have a strong relationship until later in life. I can see what parts I am based on my culture heritage and my biological heritage. But in transracial adoptions, it's kind of more complex because you're reminded every day of your differences, right? Whether it's a stranger's stare or an inquisitive child. This happened to us yesterday. She was like, oh, that's her sister? Oh, (laughs) to see the two girls together, right? Um, Then you're reminded of your biological heritage versus your cultural heritage. I lost my place, so hold on, I'm finding it. I, um, in fact, when she was little, I, she started doing this thing, she was like four and five, where she would just say, I love you, mom, like really loud in a store. And at first, I love you too, like it was you know, nice. But then I realized she was doing it to prove to someone who she felt was staring at us. Um, so we've had many conversations when she was little about how we have nothing to prove to anybody in the world, um, that we know who we are to one another. And in fact, to start recognizing that, because I have felt this since, We've had all, all of our children that people recognize your bond. Um, I've, I've only twice has someone not referred to me as mom when talking about me in front of her because they recognize the bond over the differences of what we look like. Um, and for her to see that too, so she has more security in that. But also knowing the, the importance of racial mirrors. Um, representation is so important and we still desire to have more diversity in our lives And when I say diversity, I mean of all races and all walks of life, which makes our lives more richer and, in my opinion, more of God's image. We are so thankful for the village that God has given us over the years, because it really does take a village to raise a child, especially four. Can I just say that? (laughs) But specifically, I have one friend who has dedicated herself to mentor Kylie, who is a racial mirror for her, and who also has a sister who is a day younger than Kylie, who has become a surrogate daughter to us as well. So it works for both of us. Um, but this person in our life is a person that I, she's not afraid to be very honest with me about racial issues, and I am open with her about uh, race with. So there's a comfort level, so it's good for all of us. Stereotyping. What is stereotyping? A great definition is classifying a person solely by heritage is what we call stereotyping. Stereotyping unfairly assigns a person a culture based on his or her heritage alone. 
When I found this definition, this is from, I referenced our, where we're getting a lot of the information from on the side. This was from the blog that I read about transracial adoptions, and I found like this definition fits stereotyping perfectly to me. Um, and to be honest, we didn't really fully understand this until last year. So our eyes, like many of us, were open pretty wide at the witness of the murder of George Floyd. Kylie was actually in the room when the news was on. We had no idea what was about to happen. We were just hanging out talking. I, honestly, the news is like never on. I don't even know how that happened. Um, but we weren't paying attention until we did. And we all watched as it happened and seeing it then and then seeing it through Kylie's eyes killed us as parents. She saw the racism immediately, as we all did. But she saw herself. Oh, I saw her. As a mother and as, a father, as her father, we felt every bit of it. We felt her fear, we felt her pain, we felt her questioning. We also recognized how ignorant we were in terms of what we knew about how others will perceive her. We have been relying on how we were raising her and we didn't really think about how stereotyping could affect her. I mean, we knew, but we didn't know, if that makes sense. I may never fully understand what it means to be black. I didn't grow up with those experiences, nor did my parents, nor did their parents, or their parents, but I am a mother of a black child, and he's a father of a black child, and that we can relate to. We understand the fear and the anger of being a parent of a black child. We are grafted together, which means when she hurts, we hurt. If she hurts, we're going to do everything in our power to help bring her healing. So, what's, so that's where that humility actually has to come in play, because we have to actually humble ourselves to listen to that hurt and be a part of the healing process because it really matters. Stereotyping is not limited to black children and adults. They are a part of every heritage. This is why it is so important to build a solid foundation of pride in their heritage in order to battle against any stereotyping they may face in the future. Knowing who we are and knowing who we aren't helps us to combat racism with educating educating where people are misguided by stereotypes. Yes. So here are some points in closing. There are two messages I feel that are constantly being thrown at our families, families like all of ours. The first that I feel is constantly being thrown at is, number one, that our children are broken and that they will remain broken and no matter what we do, nothing will change that. And the second is that we will never be enough for them, that... Both of those truths I refuse to believe, that I refuse to let my child also be told that this is their truth, because every journey is different, and one person's truth is not everyone's truth. However, I do recognize that my beautiful family came at a pretty huge cost. No matter what the reasons, my child deserved to be born in an unbroken situation. <laughs> she deserved to be born into an unbroken world, but they weren't. And as much as I love them, I actually want that for them. I would want them to never have hurt the way they have been hurt because of the loss of their birth families. That, that truth actually even took me years to say out loud because I thought that that meant that I didn't deserve to be their mom. And that's not true either. I was meant to be their mom even though it came at such a cost. Our family is part of a redemption story, not just for us, but also a redemption story for their bio families. Um, I hand wrote this part, sorry. Our stories change our heritage forever, so we all have such a huge him impact on future generations. Oh, did I choke you up? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, know your world at home and community. Know your world at home and community may be different elsewhere. Our communities make us feel safe, so safe that we forget it may not be the way that way everywhere. Have you ever left California on vacation? We have, and let's just say we really miss the comfort of our communities here in California. Yeah. Idaho. No, just kidding. <laughs> Number three, can you relate? Oh, that is easy. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> you may not always be able to relate because you don't have the shared experience of growing up in a heritage in that heritage, but know that you can relate as their parent. You grafted you are grafted in don't fully dismiss that you can't be a part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. I refuse to be excluded from the healing of my child. I will fight to be a part of the solution regardless because I am their father. 
in fact, that's actually what we talked to Kylie about when we were tell asking her blessing for this, is about how important it is to, for every perspective to have a seat at the table, that these conversations are happening from all perspectives to have a full picture of what's, what it's really like. Uh, the last point, I think it's the last point, is um, to look for resources. This one's actually really hard when it comes to transracial adoptions because there is an act of humility and you need to hear hard truths that are hard to listen to, especially when you don't have shared experiences. However, it's really important that you hear them. But I've also experienced truth being presented at me both ways. Um, resources like Be the Bridge uh, is a great place to start for uh, resources for transracial adoption and, and re racial reconciliation efforts um, because they present truth to you in a way that can lift you up and build you as a parent to help better parent your child so that the family as a whole is healed and reconciled, right? But I've also been presented with truth like, like this and then it's like slapped me up and told me <laughs> like, you're part of the problem, not the solution. And that's too hard because then it makes you feel like there's nothing you can ever do that will ever be enough. And that's just not true. You're called to be their parent. You're the parent. You're enough. And I think that um, it's both. You have to be open to it, but then you also have to be stubborn, which is my last line, um, because stubbornness is, is stand on your truth as your family because that's our role, right? We have to stand up for our families to say, this is what's true for our family. Our journey is different. This is what it looks like but also still open to learn because we don't know everything. We have grown so much when it comes to just um, this topic in general in the last year. And nowhere close have we arrived. <laughs> so I know that there's so much growth still to be through our experiences and through and our children too. I know that Kylie will grow more in her identity as she becomes a young adult and dives in deep. And um, so be stubborn, but be open-minded if that totally makes sense. So just know that you um, I got off topic, but know that parenting uh, is hard, but it's one of the greatest honors, and that it's important to water our tree, to know that you are enough, and that you're meant to be, and that you're a forever family. Even fostering, you forever have an impact on that child. So that's all we have.